Cabin Sports Radio. Here comes the siren. I want to go higher. Oh, my goodness. One week in to the NHL regular season, and Ish is already hitting the fan on and off the ice. Welcome to Cabin Sports Radio. Unbreakable Mike Gibbons and myself, Lecter, with you. How you doing, Mike? Living the dream, man. How you doing? Living the dream. Every day. What dream? Every day. Oh, just every day. Yeah. Yeah. Every day is a new dream. It's my (laughs) go-to. So lots of NHL coming up in the show. We'll talk some NBA Raptors making some big headlines. And uh, we got interview with Jack Duffy from Sport North. He'll be in a little bit later on to talk about the NWT Sport Hall of Fame. All that and more coming up on Cabin Sports Radio. The CSR Podcast. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. As I mentioned off the top of the show, a little bit later on, we will be joined by Communications Director for Sport North, Jack Duffy, who uh, is in to announce the names going into this year's NWT Sport Hall of Fame induction ceremony, uh, which is coming up uh, next month. So look forward to that. Should be a very fun night, and Jack will have more about that. But welcome to Cabin Sports Radio Unbreakable Mike Gibbons and myself joining you once again, as we always do. Mike, uh, a big week in hockey, of course. Mm. It is just the start of the NHL regular season, but there already is so much to talk about. Uh, So much happened in the first week. I don't know if you saw this. There was a bizarre rumor that Robert Kraft had uh, bought the Ottawa Senators. Oh, wow. I don't know where that one came from. I miss that one. (laughs) It could have been, uh, you know, Eugene Melnick is... uh, He's uh, he's an interesting character, and mm. uh, and the character quality. Yeah, mm, I don't know about quality. That might be the wrong word. But the uh, the characterness of the <laughs> Ottawa Senator ownership almost got even bigger and more ridiculous. But yeah. apparently, that was a completely uh, bunk rumor and has since disappeared. Uh, the Toronto Maple Leafs already blew their four, first three goal lead of the season. Yeah, that's right. Uh, you were telling me the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, Captain Steven Stamkos, lost it on his team. He had some words to say. I didn't even hear about they, that. They fell to 1-1-1, one, one, and one, so a pretty unremarkable start after, what do they have, 62 wins last year? I think they set a regular season record yep. for, for wins in a season, uh, but we saw how far that took them, swept mm-hmm. at the hands. When we did our, our really bad playoff preview, Yep. Uh, subsequent to our really bad regular season preview. A um, <laughs> few months apart, yeah, but yeah, yeah, just as bad. We didn't learn anything over that 82-game stretch. No. Um, so probably the frustration still from that really early exit in the spring, but basically yeah. telling reporters after the game, just just letting his teammates have it a little bit. But more, yeah. more of, it felt like more of a, he's a captain, right? So more yeah. of a motivational type, you know, stick, um, basically saying, uh, we think that we can just outskill everyone on any given night and right. not put in the required effort to get a W. Um, so I think that's more where it was coming from. And this is after, I believe it was in their game against Carolina on Saturday, they didn't register a single shot in the second period, which is wow. pretty remarkable yeah. considering the front-end talent that they have. Art Ross winner, they've got the Vezina, reigning Vesna winner yeah. on their team, Steven Stamkos, of course, Braden Point, who just got re-inked to a, a new deal. Lots of fire firepower on that team yeah um so i think it was more a way of you know one that lighting one. a fire yeah, yeah yeah not off to the start they probably would have liked yeah so just lighting a bit of a fire so yeah. they're not just getting rid of those bad habits i know it's still early but it seems like the frustration of last year's early exit might still be stewing a little bit and fair enough i mean mm. like you, you imagine being steven stamkos coming into this season where you're you you've only just washed away the embarrassment of yeah being a record-setting regular season NHL club in the modern era, and then getting swept out yeah. of the first round of the playoffs. Yeah, you know the Columbus Blue Jackets had a good team, but they, they were not supposed to sweep the Tampa Bay no. Lightning. And and you know to your point about uh, Stamco saying that they feel like they could just outskill everyone, they pretty much did last year. Yeah, but now 
everyone's gunning for them. Yeah. Right? They know that they were the best team in the regular season last year, which is where we are again. We're in the regular season. Yeah. But they know that this team has uh, a bit of fragility to it now. I think he stopped short of calling them soft, but that's sort of, it seemed like that's really what he was trying to say, especially yeah. after Columbus really imposed their will yeah. physically. Uh, they had a great trade deadline, if you recall, going back to last year. So mm-hmm. we thought they might have been gunning for the Metropolitan Crown, maybe, yeah. uh, and then fall all the way back into the wild card pitcher. Uh, we knew Tampa was going to finish first. And then in that 1 8 matchup, to be fair, there was a lot of upsets last year. We, yeah. we had a lot of our predictions wrong. Yep, no shortage of uh, those. See, it's <laughs> not our fault. Yeah, exactly. Lots, <laughs> all the pundits. All the pundits were wrong. Um, but, but yeah, you, he was sort of alluding to that. You could tell it was like, you got to, once you take one on the chin, yeah. they sort of, they don't hit right back. It, right. It's, it felt like that's what he was really trying to say. But they've got an extremely talented team, and yeah. it might be easy sometimes to think that you can just get by on that alone. But but we know, of course, especially in professional sports, you can't. You gotta you gotta outplay the opponent, and I think that's more so where that was coming from. Watch them go on a little bit of a run now. I could see it happening. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's what a good captain yeah. has to do, right? If you're not coming out of the gates the way you think your team should be, especially a team with as high of ex- expectations as the Tampa Bay Lightning. Steven Stamkos can't just sit back and say, yeah, 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 you know, we'll find it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you kind of got to light a a bit of a fire in some way. So that's definitely what he was shooting for there. But uh, surprisingly, most of the uh, controversy in the first week coming not so much from on the ice or technically off the ice. Mm -hmm. It's coming from above the ice. Uh, This past Wednesday, the regular season opener, first game, Toronto Maple Leafs versus, versus the Ottawa Senators. Jim Houston, longtime play-by-play man for CBC, basically took over as the uh, the main play-by-play guy from Bob Cole several years back. I don't mm-hmm. know how long it's been, but he's been around forever. He's been an absolute professional and pretty much the the model of excellence in the the, the play-by-play hockey broadcasting industry. Had a bit of a gaff yeah. that game. Obviously, everyone is uh, pretty aware of Austin Matthews and now his off-season antics that came to light, only came to light to the Toronto Maple Leafs themselves in the middle of training camp, even though it happened back in May, as uh, legal charges were being filed against him. We all kind of know what happened now, and here was Jim Houston's take on the situation during that game on Wednesday after Austin Matthews had just scored his second goal of the night for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Do you know about his uh, indiscretion over the summer or alleged indiscretion? When I thought about that, I looked back to 2012 and thought about Patrick Kane. Yeah. 24-year-old for the Chicago Blackhawks, got into a little trouble with too many cameras around in Wisconsin that summer. And what did he do? He came back and was Conn Smythe Trophy winner and won the Stanley Cup. And that's how you put a little problem behind you. Yeah. That's yeah. not how you put legal troubles off the ice yeah. behind you. Yeah. We were saying I'll... before the before we went on air here that it just... I, I think I get what... Jim Houston was trying to say, first of all, when you're talking about the the <laughs> transgressions of Patrick Kane yeah. from his past, that's a whole, whole nother dimension that you, I, don't, I don't know if you really want to make too many comparables to. And there's mm. at least several other incidents you could have chosen from. I don't know if they would have helped his analogy at all, but Patrick Kane, not someone you really want to be comparing yourself to as far as your off-ice uh, conduct goes. Mm-hmm. But playing well as a hockey player, scoring goals, yeah. does not absolve you of stupid things you've done off the ice. No. And it's 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 as if he's trying to create this little narrative, yeah. almost, um, like a comeback. Like, this is going to be a comeback story yeah. for Austin. Yeah, someone, like a redemption story. Someone who doesn't really need one. Yeah. Um, the, uh, as far as we know, this is his first uh, incident. Yeah. Yeah. Um, with the law outside of outside of hockey, but it's not like he he's in need of a bounce back season. Uh, no, forty goal in his, in his rookie year, uh, and he's hit the thirty goal plateau in the subsequent two years. If he could stay healthy over yeah. the course of a season, he would be in the running for a Rocket Richard uh, Trophy. He always performs well in October. He's one of the best goal scorers in the month of October. For, so starts off really strong. 
but no, it, it's it's almost like he's trying to create this narrative. He's he's had this this little problem, as he said it. He, yeah. He's facing charges right now, and it's yeah. it's a story that just doesn't make him look good, especially when he didn't come forward to his team about it. I don't really know how much his name was thrown around when we're talking about the captaincy of the Toronto Maple Leafs. Right. We said with Jay last week that someone like John Tavares just exudes captaincy a lot more than than someone like Austin Matthews, and, and not to take anything away from him. So I don't know how much this situation played into that. They probably made that decision beforehand anyways. Yeah. But to, to call it a, a little problem... And that if he goes out and he does really well at his job this year, well, we'll we'll all forget about it and we'll put this situation behind us and he is absolved of any and all sin because he did his job? Yeah, I mean, Jim Houston made it sound more like he was like a little bit constipated or something that morning. Not not like he had gotten trouble with the law over a potentially uh, serious issue that he is now dealing with. So Jim Houston... Taking a little bit of heat on uh, for that one on Twitter. As far as I know, I was looking around today, and I don't think I have seen a response uh, from no. Jim Houston. You know, one way or the other, he hasn't uh, he hasn't really acknowledged it. I don't know if there's really much to gain for him. I mean, I, I guess you could come out and and say, hey, you know, I I yeah, I I probably shouldn't have said that or shouldn't have framed it the way I mm-hmm. did, and I apologize for that. But at, at the same time, it's one of those things where I mean. It's not like Jim Houston was pulling down his pants in front of uh, security guards yeah. and getting drunk. So, like, he really hasn't done anything wrong per se. Just maybe, like you say, uh, avoid this this forced narrative. Yeah, and I mean, Jim Houston does that. It's it, it's part of his his charm as a broadcaster, as a hockey broadcaster, that he is very good at creating storylines yep. to to engage the viewer further. But that one. Uh, let, let's just call that one a miss. Yeah. Uh, the other one, Jack Edwards, uh, who was the play-by-play man for the Boston Bruins and has been for several years now, he came under fire a little bit later on in the week when the Bruins played the Dallas Stars in a game and Roman Polak went into the boards awkwardly, lay on the ice uh, motionless for for a few minutes and was actually stretchered off the ice. And in the heat of the moment after it happened... Jack Edwards made a comment that is uh, equally not resonating well with viewers. Here is a clip of that play. Wagner goes to the corner. Polak holds up for a hit. Gave him that little chuck in the lower back. And Polak. Yeah, that looks self-induced, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, has a little bit of bad hockey karma. He wants to be a physical guy. He is a physical guy. He has an opportunity to, you know, make a hard physical body contact play on a physical guy like Chris Wagner. But all of a sudden, he gets himself into an awkward position, and he goes into the boards in a very vulnerable position, and that did not end well. Yeah, so if you didn't see the actual highlight, uh, Roman Polak and Chris Wagner of the Boston Bruins were uh, racing for a puck towards the end boards. One of those typical plays where, I mean, this this was not a potential icing, so that, you know, the whole hybrid icing doesn't help it, but it's one of those potentially dangerous plays where you've got two players going at fairly high speeds towards a wall mm. that doesn't move, and and they, they both go into the boards a bit awkwardly, and, uh, and, and Polak came out worse for it. He actually had to be stretchered yeah. off the ice in the end. Um, Alan Walsh, who is a player agent and uh, happens to be Roman Polak's agent, was not particularly thrilled with the comments of uh, of Jack Edwards and uh, tweeted about it saying, quote, I have tremendous respect for the Bruins players that sent best wishes, all class. As for Jack Edwards, <laughs> to say Roman's injury was, quote, bad hockey karma while he was laying motionless on the ice, you are truly a piece of bleep. <laughs> And an absolute disgrace. Mm -hmm. So uh, Alan Walsh pulling no punches on his feelings about Jack Edwards' call there. Uh, Jack Edwards actually did respond to to the the negative backlash he was getting from that comment, saying, I stand by my real-time call. I think Brick, uh, which is his color commentator you heard in that clip, Andy Brickley, nailed it when he said Polak's injury was self-induced. I am actually going to defend Jack Edwards a little bit on this one, and... This isn't something I would normally do, because mm. don't get me wrong, I am no Jack Edwards fan. 
I think he is probably the most homer of all homer oh, play-by-play yeah. announcers. I don't like the way he gets into it a little too much sometimes with the players and what he thinks he is seeing on the ice. But if you watch the clip and you see the two players going in, Chris Wagner, Roman Polak, they're both two guys who, you know, don't they don't shy away from the physical stuff. They mm-hmm. both like to get get into it, get their noses dirty. But Roman Polak, as they're going into the boards, he's behind Wagner, and he does this thing that I I absolutely hate when I see players do. He puts his stick in a, in a cross-checking motion into the lower back of of Wagner, and you see him start to like push down. And Wagner actually comes out like he went into the boards kind of awkwardly too, but came out you know no worse for wear. He mm-hmm. was okay. But it's the kind of play, the, the, thi- the, the, the maneuver that Polak went to do, and Wagner kind of spun off it uh, unintentionally, really. It was because of what Polak was doing. He kind of spun off it, and Polak lost his own balance because he was resting his weight on Wagner's lower back. Now, I don't necessarily like the bad hockey karma comment because i think it indi- it, it implies that roman polak is a a dirty player yeah. and deserve to be hurt which is obviously a ridiculous thing to say but if i can interpret it differently i i think maybe what he meant by it was that going for that that dangerous maneuver towards mm. the boards potentially putting uh, Chris Wagner in a, in a dangerous situation and then in the end hurting himself right i th- i think that is what he meant yeah. by the bad hockey karma comment um but you know it, it's just it's one of those things where it's like i think i know what he meant right. to say but you just didn't come out no. well saying it so you're giving him the benefit of the doubt i'm giving a him the benefit here. of the doubt on yeah. this one yeah i uh i think yeah more so and and it's funny because when he the as you alluded to when he responded to the criticism and pointed to what the color commentator had said that he stands by that it was but that's not what you said you that yeah. was what your color commentator said that it was self-induced and it very well may have been yeah but it, it's a context thing it's a perspective thing and when people hear that you're saying it's a bad karma play uh, yeah that's as as a listener that's what I'm taking from it is that you're implying that he's got a long history of being a violent yeah. or a dirty player that he had and, it coming and he had this coming yeah. and especially when the player is is stretchered off the ice it's just not a good look it's yeah. not a good sound um and Jack Edwards has a long history of saying these type of remarkable things for a team that's kind of unlikable, they've had their fair <laughs> shit. I'm biased. Whatever do you I'm, mean, Michael? I'm biased, of course. But, you know, they, they've had their fair share of bruisers, even in, in more recent seasons. And there are probably a lot of teams that aren't too fond of them. But a lot of people that aren't fond of the way he calls games because he does do this type of thing. Mm-hmm. But He's a bit outrageous. He is a bit outrageous. But yeah. maybe it is a context thing. Maybe it's a perspective thing. But I think when Summer's being stretchered off the ice, that's when you... You maybe keep those sentiments to yourself a bit. Yeah, the optics were were mm-hmm. absolutely awful, and I I think I think maybe in hindsight, even though he didn't come out and say this, maybe because he thought maybe I'll keep a few more of my comments to myself regarding this <laughs> incident yeah. now, which seems ridiculous for Jack Edwards. Um, but I, I, the optics are are pretty bad, and I and I think if he if he could have done it all over again, I mean, obviously you don't know. When someone goes into the boards, right? You don't know in that moment if the stretchers gonna That's come out true. or not. But it's like a, maybe a bite your tongue, yeah, kind of yeah. moment. Um, but so I, I am defending Jack Edwards a little bit on this one. But having said that, <laughs> you mentioned he has a history of making some outrageous oh, calls. He's so a I, goof. You know what, Mike? Let's uh, let's take a look back at some of the most outrageous calls of Jack Edwards. Marchier goes for the puck and then that flying vicious right elbow as he's fighting his way trying to get to that second chance Jersey looking for a penalty on the play I don't see any coming so this is one thing about the bad hockey karma comment if there is such a thing frankly I don't even know if Marchand was aware of Johansson's body position there not even aware when a vicious elbow yeah. was delivered. He didn't even know he was there. And Brad Marchand? Yeah. That guy? No. 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 Clean game. Come on. Always. 
Uh, yeah, if bad hockey karma is a thing, I, I'm really afraid for Brad Marsh. <laughs> oh. But Let's be honest yeah. here. We don't want anything bad to happen. We do not want anything bad to happen. That's why I'm hoping bad hockey karma isn't a thing yeah. and Jack Edwards is way out to lunch exactly. on this. Because if anyone's got bad hockey karma oh. coming to them... It, it might be yeah. Brad Marsh. Yeah. Maybe. All right, let's continue. Some more Jack Edwards for you. Here comes Michael Ryder. The Bruins extending themselves to try to defend a one-goal lead late. Handle it goes down as if shot. <laughs> Get up. Here comes Camilleri. Montreal trying to nurse ridiculous calls out of the referees. <laughs> Just a great hit in the Montreal zone. Oh. And Handle it trying to dive for a penalty. Now, the funny thing about that play was that Roman Hammerlick was the one who delivered the hit. Yeah. <laughs> Get a shot! Get up! Uh, so, okay. So we've got, he is, wears rose-colored glasses when it comes to anything that Brad Marchand does. Yes. Uh, bad hockey karma comes back to bite players. He chirps players, yells at them like a like a common moron. Mm. Uh, what else he got for us, Jack? We're going to see some activity behind the play. Yeah, it's going to be Charlie's going to go to the box. A little contact with Jason Spencer. We're going to call for a cross check. After Chara moves his puck up in the direction of Milan Lucic. Lucic's in a pretty good battle to get away from his man. A little bit of contact. Oh, that's a sell job. Oh, oh, oh come on. Pretty good sell job there by Spencer. Oh, they want my arm. They never work again. <laughs> It has not been a productive power play for the Ottawa Senators in the season series against the Bruins, but an opportunity here now. You know, the amazing thing about that clip is that his color commentator, again, Andy Brickley, actually it actually is able to resume with a with a <laughs> some kind of decorum of of professionalism yes. after Jack Edwards uh mocks a player. Yeah. And uh, then I, I don't know if that was a porky pig impression he yeah. was going for there. Um, but like it was pretty good. Uh, it was actually, I mean, full marks <laughs> on the impression. Not bad. Pretty good, Porky Pig. But like, I, I mean, I, again, is Dano Chara cross checking someone? What? I just, I don't know. That doesn't, that doesn't happen. happen. No. All right, what else you got for us, Jack? Centering pass for Bieksa right on the door mouth, and Perron nudges Miller into Gustafson, and that's not a wise idea. Yeah, David Perron. Well, here's Stewart having a go with. Tory Krug, what a manly thing to do for Chris Stewart. Taking on a guy Krug's size. Yeah, Stewart's working him over because Krug is punching uphill, and I hope Chris Stewart feels really good about himself. Oh, nice answer by Krug. Teammates love that, Jack. 6'2", 231, going after a guy who's 5'9", 181. And considering he's given up 50 pounds, but he's also got an advantage of about 50 IQ points, I think you got to think pretty well of Krug in that exchange. Wow. So he insults players' intelligence. Yep. And, I mean, poor Tory Krug. You know? Yeah. Poor guy. Yeah. He doesn't deserve anything that yeah. comes his way. Especially in a skirmish on the ice. Jeez. All right, one more, Jack. Uh, of course, while well, we heard he, he doesn't like it when, when bigger players uh, take on a smaller Boston Bruins player, uh, let's see what he thinks when, when Sedano Chara. The guy who's 6'9. The guy who's 6'9. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. the one. Okay. What aesthetically is probably the goal of the year for the Bruins. Chara with a big hit on Downey. Clean. <laughs> Chara takes a hard right from Downey. We explained this in the last game. Now Chara's going to go. He's just about sick and tired of this little punk. Oh, <laughs> man. The big guy is just unloading. Uh, Downey says, where am I? Mommy, help. Oh, my God. Uh, wow. Right? Jack Edwards, wow. everybody. Wow. <laughs> Must be beloved in Massachusetts. He might as well be a fan. Oh, absolutely beloved. And if that guy hasn't lost his job by now in professional broadcasting, well, I think he's pretty much untouchable at this mm. point. So do your thing, Jack Edwards. Do your thing. The Cabin Sports Radio Podcast, brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward.
Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. And stay tuned because coming up next, we will have communications director for Sport North, Jack Duffy, on the show. And he is going to unveil, officially announce the entrance into this year's NWT Sport Hall of Fame ceremony. That's going to be a lot of fun. But before that, we had a big news. We were talking a few weeks ago about how the offseason has been ridiculously quiet for the Toronto Raptors ever since Kawhi Watch, Kawhi Gate, Spy Kawhi, whatever that was called. I like that. You like that? I Spy Kawhi? I Spy Kawhi. That's good. (laughs) I mean, we were tracking airplanes, so yeah. Right? It got pretty intense. Yeah. But ever since that came to a conclusion and and a a very, um, you know, unsatisfying conclusion for Toronto Raptors fans, but kind of one you were prepared for. Yeah. It's been pretty quiet since then until today. Kyle Lowry agreed to a one-year contract extension with the Raptors worth $31 million. Pretty good. Not too bad. Fresh off of a three-year $33 million contract AAV, so three-year $100 million, uh, which will see him through the end of this coming up season, and then uh, this new deal will see him through the 2020-2021 season. Yeah, so Uh, this obviously the Raptors' attempt to basically... Basically quash the rumors that would have ensued all season long had yes. they not extended him before now that it's like, well, is he going to get traded at the trade deadline? Yeah. He doesn't have a contract passed this year. Exactly. And and you mentioned uh, Kawhi Gate. I'm assuming when he was meeting with the Toronto Raptors, um, when he was also meeting with the Lakers and the Clippers at the start of the uh, offseason and the free agency period, I'm a, if, you, if I'm Masai Ujiri, you're offering him literally whatever he wants. You're bringing Drake... In you're bringing everyone else in. You are giving Kawhi whatever he wants. Yeah, uh, and when he unless has, he didn't want Drake, uh, yeah, yeah, then throw him away. Um, <laughs> and give the man what he wants. Now, uh, when he did decide to go to the Clippers uh, with Paul George, suddenly you got a whole lot of cap space at your disposal. Uh-huh. So they take care of business. I think before this they were sitting with around sixty million. Uh, Oof. remaining cap space for oh. the right. It's very different. Kyle you, Dubas on the other side of the oh, building. Man. There's just like, oh, what I would do yeah. with sixty million, right? So eighty. What is it? The NHL like eighty-one million? I think uh, it is. I think around there. Yeah. Yeah. NBA is around one fifteen, one twenty, and rising with uh, television yeah. rights. Um. So yeah, they they take care of of probably the most important thing right after this whole Kawhi decision takes place and that would have been the storyline right we got got expiring deals for both kyle lowry um marcus all and and serge ibaka Mm. so now i think if you're part of the management team in toronto you're going to see how the year plays out right Uh, and and i still think they're a top four five team in the eastern conference they'll be fighting for home court um and then really go from there once you get to the trade deadline in in february we'll have to have a, a Good look at your organization and see if you can maybe uh, sell for parts for both Marcus Gasol and Serge Ibaka. Both played tremendous roles in the Raptors championship run back in June, so you can get some good assets there, some picks. Uh, I don't know if you want a rotation player or, or someone you can develop, um, but I think that's it looks like that's the direction they're going now, so they've recommitted to Kyle Lowry. And it's been longest tenured Raptor, um, and, and we'll see that for, for one more year, but really... His time in Toronto has been pretty special, and and even before this uh, this deal came into place, uh, Masai Ujiri saying that there's legacy status for for yeah. Kyle Lowry now. Absolutely, he said he he would like to finish his career in Toronto. Yeah, uh, had issues uh, before coming to Toronto in both Houston and and Memphis. Sort of had the reputation of of not being a great locker room guy, mm. uh, coming with attitude. And he could have left the Toronto Raptors in, in 2013. There was a deal in place that would have seen him go to the Knicks. And it was James Dolan uh, of the Knicks who nicks that at the at the last second. Very nice. Uh, you like that? Yeah. yeah Knicks, good. Knicks, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so things could have turned out a lot differently for Lowry. And then we know that he developed that really good on and off the court relationship with uh, DeMar DeRozan. They're still hanging out in the off season, even though they're no well, longer teammates. Nice. Right. Yeah. And then of course he cemented his, his status among the Raptors greats with a, with an, a, an NBA championship back in June. So it's just a good story all around. Yeah. Um, and both sides having nothing but, but good things to say about how the negotiation process went. Right. Lowry wanted to stay in Toronto. 
um, and they were very appreciative of how Maasai and management approached it and respected him. Uh, and he he deserves every ounce of that now. He he right. even with Kawhi, he he always was the heart and soul. Yeah, and even when when DeRozan was with the squad, he's an absolute bulldog. He's mm-hmm. a South South Philly boy. Um, you know. So he, he, he was always, always the heart and soul of the team, and then they'll see him for, for one more year after this year. He can still be traded as part of this deal. Right. I don't imagine that's something that would happen now. But I'm sure he probably has a lot of say in it. Yeah, exactly. Come down. Yeah. yeah. Um, but it's really now becomes, and we know that the core is going to be built around guys like Fred Van Fleet and Pascal Siakam, who is also reportedly seeking a max extension yeah. um, com- coming into the last year of his, his rookie um, scale contract this year. Um, and then someone like OG Ananobi, who you hope you get a bit of a bounce back season from. So long term, you're going to build around those three guys mm-hmm. and then whatever else comes up the system or, or in the way of draft picks or trades. Um, but I think Come the spring, they'll have to take a little bit of a look at where they're positioned in the Eastern Conference, and then decide uh, with the expiring contracts of both Gasol and Ibaka what's what's in the best interest for the team. Right? Isn't it just nice to be in one of those situations where the club wants this to happen, the yeah. player wants this to happen, the fans want it to happen, and it happens? Yeah, I feel like that's oddly rare in pro sports where literally every side is on the same page about a player and specifically you know like a high profile player because obviously they are there's there's always something you know whether it's like they didn't perform up to you know maybe they had an off year or something like that or they just think that they're getting paid too much or there's just like uh, chemistry in the locker room issues or something like that it's just it feels like it's kind of rare that this happens, that everyone wants it to happen, and, mm-hmm. and and you're in like a really good, comfortable situation, especially after you know as uh, as big a thing as losing someone like Kawhi Leonard. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, the the, the fiscal reality would have been a whole lot different if they were able to uh, resign Kawhi Leonard, and that would have been right. amazing from the Raptors' perspective. And then maybe you do get some guys taking hometown discounts or taking uh, championship discounts if if they know they've got a better chance at. At going deep, um, but I think I think also uh, Lowry wasn't too enthused about hitting free agency uh, at the end of next summer as a thirty-four yeah. year old. He yeah, would be at that time, it's not a good situation. No, so and and you know, it, chances going forward might have been few and far between. Yeah, even though he he is a a really great basketball player. Yeah, uh, and beloved in in this fan base, and and there are teams that would be willing to to swoop in and and pay him, no doubt. But I don't think he was too thrilled to hit free agency yeah. at the age of 34. It's just too much unknown there. No, and and, and, it, and it gives it gives the Raptors flexibility too. Uh, I, it sounds like the next free agent class 2020 isn't going to be too big, uh, but 2021, and especially with a lot of those uh, opt in and opt out clauses where players can sign for three but leave after two. Right, um, and then there reportedly is a. Uh, a super max extension in front of Giannis Antetokounmpo in Milwaukee, which he has not contemplated too seriously. So some people thinking he might already have a foot out the door. Masai was pretty instrumental in getting his family over here from Greece. So, you know, some people already making those connections. There's already the Lakers connections, the Warriors connections. So it, there's a the potential for the 2021 uh, free agency class to be very big. Uh, so this gives the Raptors some flexibility if they have that contract of Kyle Lowry now coming off the books in that year, but also maybe increase the window of their contention for another year or so. And they believe, uh, even without Kawhi, that they can still be uh, among the better teams in the Eastern Conference and maybe go really deep. Um, And outside of Kawhi and Danny Green, who, yes, played instrumental roles in the finals run, um, including the finals MVP, mm. the rest of the core is intact. Yeah, and and they'll get some healthy seasons out of uh, guys like OG Ananobi, who didn't play much, and then more. Uh, you would hope more progression in the games of guys like Pascal Siakam, Fred Van Fleet. So this gives them some flexibility, and it might increase their window of contention for for one more year. Big question for you, Mike: mm. Are you looking forward to this season? I am absolutely perfect. We'll be back. Cabin Sports Radio. Download the CSR podcast at cabinradio.ca.
Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North. We are joined in studio now by a very special guest, Jack Duffy. He's the communications director for Sport North and uh, pretty fresh communications director with Sport North. How are you doing, Jack? I'm good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks. And uh, Yeah, super fresh. Yeah. Uh, about a month. Thanks for joining us exactly. on the show. Uh, you've already you've already done a, a couple speeches for Sport North. You're up there at the uh, the Champions for Children dinner, uh, yeah. introducing uh, Lanny McDonald and Serge Savard, Billy Smith. How was that event? Uh, yeah, it was a great evening altogether. Um, and yeah, like you said, it's great to be up there representing uh, Sport North and Kids Sport and. Just even being in the same room as those guys was yeah. a pretty awesome experience. And uh, yeah, a big thank you again to the Champions for Children committee and uh, Crow Mackay for their sponsorship. Um, on a whole, like I said, it was an incredible event. The room was packed full with people yeah. from the community. And uh, yeah, they were not shy to put their hands in the pockets either, which is uh, fantastic, obviously, on our behalf for uh, Kids Sport as... Yeah, all the kids in the NWT that apply are obviously going to benefit. Yeah, from the name of the game. Yeah, that's uh, it. Yeah, looking forward to uh, eventually hearing. Yeah, what was raised because yeah, like you say, they were, nobody was shy that night. No, into definitely the not. <laughs> so that was uh, that was great to see. And 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 like you say, uh, um, big thanks to all the sponsors and kudos to uh, to you guys yourselves for uh, helping make that event a, a complete success. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. <laughs> we are here to talk about the 2019 NWT Sport Hall of Fame. The inductees have been announced. Jack. Who is going into the hall this year? All right. So uh, a little bit different uh, in terms of the structure to what's previously done. It uh, kind of falls under athlete, uh, builder, and team, right. um, which happens not every year. There has been a couple of years where there's been, for example, two athletes, one builder, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Um, and this year, what we're actually going to do is we have three athletes that are going to be inducted. Okay. Um, yeah. So to reel the names off, uh, the first one is uh, John Tram, who is a uh, gymnastics, probably more known recently for his coaching. But um, yeah, it was previously a very successful gymnast. Um, just to sort of name a few, he's got gold in Arctic Winter Games, Western Canada Games. And, uh, yeah, has represented the NWT on a national scale uh, at really sort of high levels of gymnastics. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the first one. Second one is going to be Roseanne Allen. Um, so Roseanne Allen was actually a cross-country skier who was one of the first Aboriginal women to represent Canada at the Winter Olympics. Awesome. Uh, yeah, she was uh, in the 1972 Games in Sapporo. Uh, and Shirley and Sharon Firth, which... Might be uh, more familiar names. Yeah. Um, with that, with these of what, 2016? Uh, Somewhere around there? Should know. Might be getting <laughs> my, my years mixed they're up. They're both well. definitely in there. Um, but yeah, and from that, has this uh, sort of um, nomination has kept coming forward. And uh, yeah, we thought this is the perfect year for her. Awesome. Uh, she did unfortunately pass away in 2009. Mm. But again, yeah, 10 years sort of on. Yeah. Um, yeah. He's fully deserved a place in the uh, Hall of Fame. And then the final one, uh, again, unfortunately passed away, um, is Floyd Daniels, who, uh, as myself, as playing fastball this summer, was a name that was really, really focused on. And, yeah, he's a huge figure in uh, the sport of fastball and softball. Mm -hmm. And I know that he did um, wonderful things for the sport, both as a player um yeah he's known as a real fierce competitor but a really sort of calm and quiet lovely man um uh, yeah another one just absolutely deserved of that spot awesome. um in the hall of fame yeah so yeah there's your three it's floyd daniels roseanne allen and john trump that's really exciting so uh that is happening november 22nd at the yellow knife elks uh, at the moment, you we were talking off air just before this, and you thought, well, we'll see. We might be jamming in the doors as far as uh, guests for this Hall of Fame ceremony because, 
like you mentioned, three pretty popular names and lots of people who will be looking to pay their uh, pay their respects and honor those names that are heading into the NWT Sport Hall of Fame. But uh, as of right now, November 22nd, Yellowknife Elks, uh, where can people get information about tickets for that event? Uh, so if they go on our website, um, as of next Wednesday... So Wednesday, the 9th of October, those tickets will go on sale. Okay. Um, it's actually Eventbrite itself, which uh, we'll be selling the tickets through. Um, but yeah, there'll be, I'll be flooding social media, the website, you'll see it in the newspaper, pretty much anywhere you look in town. Um, but yeah, to buy tickets itself, you'll follow the links um, through the website, which will take you to Eventbrite to okay. there. Okay, yeah. so two days from now, just stay tuned to Sport North and you'll have more information on that. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, so uh, one more thing that uh, is just on the horizon. A uh, little bit towards the end of this winter, of course, the Arctic Winter Games are happening in Whitehorse this year, March 15th to 21st, the 2020 Arctic Winter Games, and you've got some announcements to make about that. Uh, yeah, so after... A lot of back and forth and a lot of uh, trial and error. Uh, the handbook is now finalized. Okay. Uh, so the participant handbook, that is, um, which you will find the links for games registration itself, which every athlete, coach, everybody involved will have to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, the links in the handbook will take you directly to Gems Pro um, to sign up with the host society for right. the games itself. Um, and then we have also announced territorial trial dates and... Um, yeah, inside the handbook, it's uh, Appendix C, uh, but just for people who don't want to go and look at it, because it happens. Uh, <laughs> uh, December 12th and 14th uh, for selected sports, and January 23rd to 25th for selected sports too. Okay. And um, again, those have a payment with them. Uh, all the information is in that handbook, and on the website itself is the uh, registration forms. Okay. get that done and uh i will just say that you don't have to pay on the website uh there is an option to come into the sport North office and get that paid too okay sounds good so about two to three months very exciting yes. things get underway things start getting real for the arctic winter games oh Team yes. nt headed to whitehorse are you going yeah i will be there awesome. uh not fully sure on the role i will be taking on yet right um, well you won't be competing Oh, no. I uh, <laughs> I wish. But no, those days are gone. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll be there in some capacity. Yeah. Awesome. So that's very exciting. Something we look forward to uh, every time it comes up, the Arctic Winter Games. And uh, I mean, you, you, you can't find a much better host city than Whitehorse, Yukon. Like that's, yeah. uh, that's pretty top notch. So very much looking forward to that. Yeah. Um, so check out sportnorth.com to download the handbook and all of the information that you need. Uh, with this year's uh, upcoming Arctic Winter Games, as well as the territorial trials will be in there. Jack, uh, thank you so much for joining us on Cabin Sports Radio and look forward to talking to you again. Yeah, no problem. Thank you very much. You're listening to Cabin Sports Radio. Miss part of the show? Download the podcast at cabinradio.ca or on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Spotify. Cabin Sports Radio brought to you by Sport North, moving sport forward. One last segment to go. Going to leave you with uh, a little bit of uh, a little bit of entertainment to end off tonight on Cabin Sports Radio, as we like to. Uh, well, we like to do that once in a while, Mike. We like yeah. to kind of leave you with a, a bit of a moment of zen, if you will. If I may completely rip off the Daily Show for a minute, uh, just something to kind of set you on your way. So we were talking earlier in the show about uh, Jack Edwards and Jim Houston making a few on-air gaffes. You know, in the broadcast industry, that is part of the game. Nobody is perfect. We all have said stupid things. God knows I have. Mike, as far as I know, your record is pretty squeaky clean. Oh, I don't know about that. Don't know about that. Oh, no, I've had some. I've had some moments. <laughs> okay, we don't need to get into those now, but <laughs> I want to leave you with some uh, little collection of funny moments from sports broadcasters, mostly NFL. I don't know why that worked out, but uh, apparently NFL broadcasters are just the genuinely most entertaining. So we are going to say goodbye for another week here on Cabin Sports Radio. No show next week because it is Thanksgiving Monday. Right. Enjoy your Thanksgiving Monday, and we will talk to you the Monday following that. See ya. Ed, you got to turn your mic on. I think. Got his hand on the button. Going to be the, the ball. The ball was muffed.
by the Rams and recovered by the Falcons. We will redo the ruling. I thought they were doing that. <laughs> Before the commercial. Beal driving. Kicks it out. Ariza baseline. Dagger! Wow. Wow. Ariza oh, oh, oh. from the baseline for three. And the Wizards with a miraculous oh, oh. comeback in Washington. They'll, they'll pro oh. They're saying it did not go. <laughs> what a play by Webster. He knew he didn't have time to do anything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, from our angle, it looked like it dropped straight through, but clearly. I was wondering why we didn't see more reaction from the <laughs> Wizards players. Picks up two. You played in the NFL. What's longer, a half or five-eighths? Or... Uh, five-eighths is a little longer there, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Giants are coming off a worse week than Harvey Weinstein. <laughs> and they're up by 14 points. Only my L.A. guy comes up with that well, one. Well, you know. There you go. All you have to do is read the papers. <laughs> There's a cat on the field, Jim. <laughs> it's, hey, it's, it's Halloween season. Jarvis Landry stood up immediately by Keanu Reeves. <laughs> Keanu Reeves, Keanu Neal. That would be something if Keanu Reeves was in the Pro Bowl. <laughs> Keanu Neal. <laughs> had a one out of two chance. They're the only two Keanu's I know of. You'd really rather really have the six points. There, he's got it in his hand. Let's go. Throw it out there. There it is. <laughs> the biggest ovation of the night. He said, I got flags too. <laughs> I got one. Hey, somebody has run out on the field. Some goofball in a hat and a red shirt. Now he takes off the shirt. He's running down the middle by the 50. He's at the 30. He's bare-chested and banging his chest. Now he runs the opposite way. He runs at the 50. He runs at the 40. The guy is drunk, but there he goes. The 20. They're chasing him. They're not going to get him. Waving his arms, bare-chested. Somebody stop Look that out. man. Here comes the blue coat, Kevin. Oh, they got him. Here comes coming the blue from the left. Oh, and they tackle him at the 40-yard line. Oh, that was the most exciting thing to happen tonight. The Colts win it, 26-22. Game's over. Game is finally <laughs> over. Colts win, 26-22.